In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we note, so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, verse 35. Matthew chapter 26, verse 35. And Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. They all said the same thing. They all became very self-righteous, but they were sincere. They were extremely sincere about all of this. None of them intended to betray or deny our Lord Jesus Christ except one, Judas, he intended to. But uh, they were all sincere in their uh, acknowledgement of saying, uh, we, we'll never do this. Even if we have to die with you, we're not going to deny you. Uh, this was something that uh, they really didn't think they would do. But the fact is, sincerity doesn't mean you have Bible doctrine. And a lot of people can be sincere about their love for God and say, I love God, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I love God. And then all that is, they might be even very sincere about it, but if you don't know God, you don't love God. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't love Jesus Christ. And even though these, these disciples have been with our Lord for about three years, uh, they know him personally, but they don't know all the doctrine he's been teaching, and they've uh, even rejected some of the doctrine, and they have neglected other parts of the doctrine, and sometimes they didn't listen, and sometimes they fell asleep, and uh, pretty much they are a reflection of uh, pretty much everyone. And that is uh, the fact that uh, they became sincere didn't mean that they uh, would follow our Lord. And Sincerity is meaningless. The only thing that means anything is what you think. And you are what you think. There's a saying that came out that says you are what you eat. No, you are what you think. And if you think Bible doctrine, if you think the Word of God, then you are on the right track. If you don't think in those terms, you're on the wrong track and you'll go toward emotionalism. And emotionalism always gravitates toward sincerity and sincerity is meaningless. And a lot of you, uh, not a lot of you, but the, the young ladies need to understand that sincerity is meaningless. A lot of young men may seem sincere especially when you get older and start dating them. But that sincerity could be a sheep in wolves' clothing. They could want something from you, like sex, and yet be very sincere in their, uh, oh, they'll say they love you, and you say, oh, that's, they're so sincere about their love. And none of it's true. It's all false. And even sometimes they may be sincere, but they may be retarded and have no sense. And so... You don't uh, follow sincerity. You follow what's uh, in the soul, or if that is in terms of human relationships. And in terms of your relationship with God, what matters is what's in your soul, and that is Bible doctrine. Now, we noted that Peter did deny Christ three times. Now, Peter is brought out because he has uh, apparently made himself the leader of the group. He's made himself the leader of the pack of twelve now, Jesus Christ is the true leader, but uh, uh, for some reason, Peter here likes to be a leader. And he wants to lead all the time, but he just doesn't have enough doctrine. And so Peter is pointed out specifically. Yet we will note when we continue in this study that all the disciples fell away from Christ, not just Peter. They all denied him. 
Uh, all except for maybe John, all of them denied him and scattered and ran away like cowards when the time came. But Peter is singled out, and that's because Peter is going to deny Christ three times, and he's actually going to end up cussing at the uh, the third time he denies Christ. He's going to be uh, cursing like a drunken sailor. Just uh, uh, say, I don't know that man. I don't know that blankety blank 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 and such and such. And that's what he's going to do. But Peter is in heaven today, and Peter is saved. And that brings us to what we were studying yesterday, and that's eternal security. And we studied the fact that we have the virtue of God rationale. And we went over that and what that means and uh, the things associated with the virtue of God. We went over the exegetical rationale of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that is very simple even in the English, but it's a, there's a paraphrastic here in which two verbs are used, which makes it uh, very important and makes it actually... It makes it uh, to where uh, it's a forceful form of expression to where the translation should say, For by grace you have been saved in the past, with the result that you stand saved forever through faith, and this salvation is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's very clear from Scripture and very clear from the Greek, from Sozo and Iami, all of which we studied uh, yesterday, and we also studied it in the Essential Series. Then we have the positional sanctification rationale, and that was found in Romans 8, 38 through 39. And we are positionally sanctified with Jesus Christ. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit uh, baptizes us. Uh, baptizes us into union with Christ in which we're in union with Him and we share in His destiny. And that means we share in His eternal life. And nothing we do and there's uh, nothing we can do to get out of that. Then we have the family of God rationale and the fact that we are royal family of God as uh, per 1 Peter 2, five and 2.9 we are royal family of God. And the fact that we're royal family means we're in the family not only just just in the family, but royalty, and even if we screw up, it doesn't mean that God disassociates with us, and because we are saved, and there are verses that indicate eternal security, which we went over yesterday. And then we have the body metaphor, and that has to do with the fact that uh, since we are royal family of God, we are part of the body of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 12:21, it says, "The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you." And this is talking about the Corinthians who became very competitive, and the uh, Corinthians, uh, the eye. <clears throat> For example, would be people like uh, people who would have the gift of tongues or people who had have some other gift that was uh, flashy. And they in the eye would always look down on someone with another gift that wasn't so flashy and talk about them and say, well, I, we have no need of that person in the church, etc. And therefore, this uh, analogy or a metaphor comes out of this. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And the head, that is Jesus Christ, cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. So even though we fail, if we've believed in Christ, uh, we're, we're, we are still going to fail. And even though we fail and we make mistakes, Jesus Christ can never say to us, He has no need of us. And He never will. And we're part of the body of Christ, and He's not going to cut us out of the body. Then we have the essence of God rationale. And this rationale is as follows. Because God is immutable, eternal, infinite, and because of the uh, immutable or eternal and infinite attributes of God, He cannot cancel salvation for any believer. 
because of his own attributes, because of his own character, he can't cancel it. Uh, he will not and he cannot because of his own character, no matter how gross any believer may be. And there are a lot of believers who are very gross. There are a lot of believers who think they're very fine when they're not and they're very gross and yet they're still going to heaven. And Jude 24 makes it very clear that it is God that keeps us for in salvation. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. This is Jude 24. I've memorized this and it's one of those that uh, one of those uh, passages that anyone who wants to understand eternal security should probably uh, memorize and it's very poetic especially in the King James. Uh, this isn't King James what I'm giving you but if you have a King James version uh, Jude 24 is very poetic. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. And that's what we have from Jude 24. And we see that it is God that keeps us from falling. We do fail, but God keeps us from falling. And He will present us faultless. Are we faultless? Let's think about it for a moment and don't raise your hand and say, yes, I am or no, I'm not. Just think about it. Say, am I faultless? No, of course. None of us are faultless. Yet we will be presented faultless. Why? Because of who and what we are? No, because we believed in Christ. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for us. Eternal security is one of the most basic doctrines there is to know. But since we're studying Peter, it's a good time to go over it again. The perfect integrity of God cannot be canceled by the failure or uh, not even by the renunciation of Christ. I've known believers renunciate Christ and go into Buddhism and go into some other weird thing or even become atheist. And this is according to 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. Faithful is the word. If he died with him, if we died with him, if we believers... Again, 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. Faithful is the word. If we died with him, and we have, that is believers have, we shall live with him. If we endure, that is in suffering for blessing, if we endure the suffering that comes along, and I tell you, if you grow in grace and in knowledge, suffering is going to come along with it. And if you don't grow in grace and in knowledge, you'll go under divine discipline, which you will not be able to handle. But if you grow in grace, you'll be able to handle it, and suffering will come your way. None of us is immune to suffering or immune to any type of... Uh, we're just not immune to it. It's the way that we grow in grace and in knowledge is to receive some suffering for blessing. If we endure, we shall rule with him. And that is to rule with him in the millennium as uh, mature believers. And in the millennium, if you go to spiritual maturity, you will reign with Christ during the millennium, the 1,000 year reign. Now you might be concerned with uh, the superficial things of life. You might be concerned with television shows. You might be concerned with uh, cheerleading. All of these things are fine in life and normal to attend and to function in and not part of sin. But you may be uh, so concerned with it that you think about that rather than learning the Word of God. Remember, if you grow in grace and in knowledge and you endure the testing that will come your way by growing in grace and in knowledge, you will come to a point in which you'll actually receive rulership in the millennium, which lasts a thousand years. And we may live to be what? Seventy? Eighty? Uh, some some people are uh, have a tendency to live longer. Uh, the oldest person that I know of now was some... A uh, woman, I forget, I heard it on the news, but I think she was uh, 112. Before that, there was a woman in France who was 120. That's a drop in that. Well, that's 10% of uh, the 1,000 years. 
and to rule with Christ for a thousand years and then to have eternal rewards for billions upon billions upon billions of years. Don't let the details of life strangle you away is what I'm saying. And that is what the Word of God is saying. If we endure, that's what Second Timothy 2, 11 through 13. If, if we endure suffering, through, uh, suffering for blessing, that is because we've been growing in grace and in knowledge, we shall rule with Him. If we will, if we deny him. Now this is something we have to understand because Peter is going to deny Christ three times. If we deny him, he will deny us. Now what was the verse previous to that talking about eternal rewards? It was talking about rulership. It was talking about ruling in the millennium. It's talking about the eternal blessings. So if we deny him, and and the way to do that is to deny the word of God, to neglect, reject the word of God, to not make it number one in your life. And if you deny it, and this is a continuous denial all of your life as a believer, if you deny it all of your life as a believer, you will lose your escrow blessings and your escrow rewards. And you will not receive rulership in the millennium. And you will not receive your rewards for eternity. And you will not receive the accolade, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Instead, you will receive shame in a resurrection body. And that's important because this is eternity. And it's hard for us to think in terms of eternity because we have so many things going on in our lives today temporally. But uh, when you think in terms of eternity, it, it changes the whole thing. To live your life in the light of eternity simply changes everything. Then it goes on to give us the, the, the next passage, 13, 2 Timothy 13. And that is that passage that tells us that we are eternally secure even if we become unfaithful. And that means we could... Uh, Renounce Christ. That's what it means, becoming unfaithful. First, you believed in Christ. And then, uh, let's say you believed in Christ when you were 16 years old. And then you go to college and you run into a professor who teaches uh, uh, the ideas of Marxism and the ideas of evolution and the ideas of uh, uh, Darwin and all of that. And then you say, you know what? I believe that we actually evolved and I don't believe in Christ anymore. I think that was a crock. It was something that was forced on me. And I don't even believe it. But you did believe it at one point when you were 16. And then later you say, no, I don't believe it. Well, what happened? You became unfaithful. Well, what does the verse say? If we are unfaithful, this Greek word means disbelieving or faithless. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. You see, our salvation depends upon Him, and He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Remember, we're part of the body of Christ. He can't deny Himself. We're in union with Christ. If we're in union with Christ, how can He deny Himself? We can't lose our salvation. It should be a comforting thing to all of us because, uh, well, it, it, if we could lose our salvation, we'd have to work awfully hard to keep it, or at least I would try to. But that's not the way. The way is simply believe in Christ and you're saved. And the spiritual life is by grace as well, and it's a wonderful thing. And so if we are unfaithful, disbelieving, faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. That's the essence of of God rationale. Then we have the anthropomorphism for eternal security. And I'm going over this because Peter denied Christ thrice. And now we have the anthropomorphism for eternal security. And anthropomorphism is simply, we know what anthropopathism is. It's a word that, uh, well, God says, I am jealous. Well, God's never jealous. He just uses it for us because we're human beings and we understand what jealousy is and that's the, our frame of reference. And an anthropomorphism is a morph. When you morph something, it's like a hand. 
says God the Father has a hand and God the Father has a foot. God the Father does not have a hand. God the Father does not have a foot. God the Father does not have eyeballs. God the Father does not have hair. God the Father is the Spirit. Now Jesus Christ in humanity sits at the right hand of God the Father, but God the Father is a spirit and he has no humanity. So this is anthropomorphism for eternal security. And anthropomorphism, if you want to write down the definition, and I'll give you the spelling because it is a long word, A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-M-O. R-P-H-I-S-M. An anthropomorphism. An anthropomorphism ascribes to God a human characteristic or a part of the human body which God does not have. But it is used to explain some divine policy to us in terms of human anatomy. So the human anatomy is used so that we might understand a point of doctrine. And that's how it has been revealed to us from the anthropomorphism. In the Old Testament, the anthropomorphism is found in Psalm 37, 24. Though he falls, and that's talking about a believer's failure, and this is Psalms 37, 24. Though he falls, talking about the failure of a believer, and David knew all about the failure of a believer because he committed both adultery and murder. Though he falls, he shall not be completely cast down because the Lord is the one who sustains him with his hands. We are sustained by the hands of God, and that's an anthropomorphism, because God doesn't have hands. But in order for us to understand it, uh, he throws in the word hands, so that we can picture it. And we can picture ourselves being cradled in the hands of God, so that uh, even though we fall, like little children fall when they first learn to walk and they start running, they just fall right over. And yet we're in the Father's hands, and that's the picture of it. And even though we fall, we're not going to be cast into eternal judgment. And that's part of eternal security. In the New Testament, we have an anthropopathism found in John 10:28. In the New Testament, we have an, excuse me, anthropomorphism, not pathism, an anthropomorphism found in John 10, 28. John 10, 28. I give to them eternal life. I give to them eternal life. They shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. God doesn't really have a hand, but this is a way to describe the fact that uh, we've been given eternal life and will never perish. It's very clear. They, that is believers, shall never perish. It's very clear. We will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. We can't even we can't even push ourselves out of the hand of God. He's got too uh, hard a grip on us. We're in His family. We're part of the family. We have eternal security, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's a thing of comfort. And this anthropomorphism says that you're in the Lord's grip forever, and He never lets go. And I've given you the example before, and I won't go over that again. Then we have the ceiling metaphor for eternal security. The ceiling metaphor. The ceiling metaphor for eternal security. I've used this on people who never believed in eternal security. It didn't work because they're negative. And if you're negative, you just won't accept it no matter how many passages you throw out. And no matter what, if you're neg- if someone is not you, but if someone is negative, it doesn't matter how many passages or how much logic you throw at them, they're not going to accept it. They'll vibrate for the whole hour message or whatever. Ephesians 1.13 In whom... 
when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Ephesians 1.13, in whom, when you heard the message of truth, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, remember common and efficacious grace. This is an unbeliever who decides uh, they go to God consciousness and therefore they uh, say, I want to know the way of salvation. So in common grace, uh, God allows them the hearing of it. So in whom, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, common grace, in whom, when you believed, you see they heard the message, then they believed it, and that's it, nothing else. And that's efficacious grace, God the Holy Spirit making that effective for your salvation. You were also sealed by means of the Holy Spirit. Sealed. Now that's something the Romans understood very well. Uh, when a letter was sealed by someone of importance, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was definite. And there's no taking it back. And they would seal it and stamp it and the wax would go around like the seal of the president. Uh, you have the seal, you're the president. And you have been sealed. And this sealing has to do with the fact that they would uh, take something and just... And then do that on the letter and the letter would be sealed. And we've been sealed by God the Holy Spirit in efficacious grace. And the fact that we've been sealed means that... Uh, no one can break that seal. That is God's seal. We're sealed in God's envelope or in God's hand or however you want to think about it. We cannot lose our salvation. Sealing is the guarantee of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in common and efficacious grace. And this is pre-salvation grace. Sealing is the guarantee of eternal salvation at the moment you believe in Jesus Christ. And this is salvation grace. And sealing is also the guarantee of eternal security in time. And this is post-salvation grace. And no matter what you do, whether you like, whether you, uh, get with the spiritual life or not, if you live in carnality the rest of your life, you're still going to heaven. And you might die miserably. Well, if you live in carnality, I'm here to tell you, you will die miserably. But you'll go to heaven and you are sealed. And you are a son or a daughter, as it says in Galatians, sons and daughters. Weos is used in that case, and it means son or daughter. It, does, it doesn't just mean son. So sealing is the guarantee of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in common and efficacious grace. That's the first case. In the second case, sealing is the guarantee of eternal salvation at the moment of uh, salvation or faith in Christ. This is called salvation grace. So we have pre-salvation grace, salvation grace. And then sealing is the guarantee of eternal security in time. This is post-salvation grace. And sealing is the guarantee of your por portfolio of invisible assets in time. And this is also part of post-salvation grace and part of what occurs when you receive your eternal rewards. And so because of uh, the fact that we have the Holy Spirit, we have Ephesians 4.30. And this is the one that I used on somebody who didn't believe in eternal security. And you might look at it and say, well, how could you use this verse for eternal security? I'll explain it. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Now, your Bibles might say, do not grieve. Do not grieve. But actually, it's a hooper. And hooper means stop. Stop doing something that you are doing. I mean, uh, there is no... Uh, God doesn't put an impossible command in the Bible. And an impossible command would be do not grieve because at some point all, all of us as believers are going to grieve God the Holy Spirit. And that would be an impossible command for us to follow. We're going to sin and we're going to grieve God the Holy Spirit. But what this is saying is stop doing what you are doing. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit of God by whom you have been sealed to the day of redemption. The day of redemption is the day of the resurrection. 
We've been sealed until the day of the resurrection, and then up we go. If the resurrection occurs tonight, up we go. We're sealed. If we all die and our bodies go into the grave or get blown up somehow, then it'll all be assembled at the resurrection anyway, and we'll be we'll actually go before those who are alive on the earth if we die first. So stop grieving the Holy Spirit of God by whom you have been sealed to the day of redemption, and that is the the resurrection. And so we have sealing as a sign of possession, and we are actually owned by our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the Bible talks about storks, and, and it talks about oxen, and it talks about how they know their owner. A stork even knows who its owner is. An oxen knows its owner, and then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, but you, do, you don't know that you're owned, that you've been purchased for a price. And that's talking about believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who do not know they've been purchased for a price. Yet an oxen knows his owner. A stork knows who his owner is. My cat knows who his owner is. Doesn't have much respect for him. But my cat knows who his owner is. And cats are less faithful than dogs. Dogs really know who their owner is. But in the animal kingdom, they know their owner. Why don't we know? the? If we don't believe in eternal security, then you don't even know who your owner is, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who possesses us. And so therefore, a seal is attached to something that signifies ownership. We're owned. We were bought with a price. The price is Jesus Christ dying on the cross. We were purchased, so we're owned. We're not even our own. We are owned. So no matter what happens after salvation, no matter what you do after salvation, God owns us. He owns us. It was His work to begin with. And will deliver us at the point of ultimate sanctification. And ultimate sanctification is the resurrection. Positional sanctification is when we believe in Christ. Ultimate sanctification is the resurrection. Now in between those two, positional and ultimate sanctification, this is all uh, technical and theological, but it should be easy to understand. Positional, Positional sanctification means you've believed in Christ, you've been put into union with Christ by the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. Now, ultimate sanctification means that when the resurrection occurs, we will be ultimately sanctified. Uh, We will leave these bodies of corruption, of immortality, and we will go and live uh, with the Lord forever through, through the millennium and then on into the eternal state. And then between those two, we have experiential sanctification experiential sanctification and that has to do with whether you live your spiritual life now you may not have experiential sanctification but if you have believed in Christ you have positional sanctification and the whole book of James deals uh, primarily there's other things it deals with gossip and all that too but the book of James deals primarily with experiential sanctification meaning uh, there's uh, faith plus doing the Word. Yes, in the spiritual life, there is faith plus believing the Word and doing the Word as we will study when we go over James. That's called experiential sanctification. Uh, But positional sanctification guarantees that we're saved, and then we will have ultimate sanctification at the resurrection of the church. Anything to which God attaches His seal belongs to God forever. So through the function of the integrity of God, we are owned by God. Then finally we have the eternal security rationale. And, uh, well, actually that was the first rationale we went over. The eternal security rationale. And then we have other things dealing with eternal security that we should already know. Because we went over this, and if you want to review it, you can go back over uh, probably one of the first uh, ten messages of... Uh, the essentials or basic series and uh, receive all of that information. 
Now moving on to uh, Matthew 26, 36. Now this is after uh, Matthew 26, 36. This is right after uh, our Lord makes it clear to Peter that he's going to screw up. Then he goes on and he moves on from there. And uh, it's getting close to the time of his uh, going to the cross. And in 2636, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. This is a private place. Our Lord wanted to go to Gethsemane to have privacy. And he went with them to a private place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane is in, it's a garden. It's an isolated garden and it's at the foot of the Mount of Olives. It's about uh, three quarters of a mile away from the eastern wall of Jerusalem. So it's outside the hustle and bustle of Jerusalem. It's outside of religion. And it's a private place. Uh, You could consider it like a park or something else uh, because it's a place, it's a garden, uh, something like a park that we would have. And uh, But there's no one really there. It's nighttime. Everyone else is probably going to bed. And so it's an, except for the people, we'll see this in a moment. So it's an isolated garden. And he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go over there in order to pray. And what this means is he's he's our Lord himself is looking for privacy. And he wants the disciples to sit apart from him. And he's going to go somewhere else, not too far away, but out of sight. He's definitely going out of sight in order to pray. And the most effective prayers, by the way, are private prayers. And our Lord is going to make a private prayer. Notice he doesn't get them all together and and say, something terrible is about to happen. You pray for me. Let's all get together in prayer. Now, there's nothing wrong with public prayer. We even have it here occasionally on Sunday at 545. But public prayer is different from what's going on here. This is private prayer of our Lord. And this is because he's... Well, he's going to go through something alone. He's going to suffer the cross alone. And notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't run around seeking help. He doesn't uh, he has no shoulder to lean on, really. No shoulder to lean on whatsoever. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there for privacy in order to pray. And in contrast, uh, Jesus Christ, in contrast to the Pharisees, the Pharisees prayed out in the open. And they always stood on the street corners. And that's because they wanted to be seen by people. And they wanted people to see them as great and religious. And they were religious, but they weren't great. They were ridiculous. And for them, it was all show. And that's the way most of Christianity has gone today. It's gone towards show. Dog and pony show. Let's have a show. Let's everybody out try to out-pray each other. Let's uh, everybody try to out-spiritualize each other. And it's not competition among believers. We're all on the same team. If we uh, try to uh, play against each other, well, of course, a house divided against itself will fall. So privacy is the central part of Christianity and that's why our Lord went to pray alone. He wanted some private time. And no other believer really needs to mind your own business or mind your business. And that's why gossip is forbidden, maligning is forbidden. And if you if you attend a church where everybody is a busybody gossiping and maligning against each other, then you must be in the wrong church because a church should be a place where somebody can come and sit down and learn the Word of God without worry of being gossiped about or maligned or judged. And that's uh, the concept of privacy that our Lord is bringing out in 2636. Then we have in 2637. Then he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And when he was alone, he became anguished and depressed. 
This was as a result of the fact that Jesus Christ was contemplating all the pain, all the suffering he was going to go through in uh, receiving the judgment of the sins of the world. The billions upon billions upon, upon quadrillions of sins of the world. Imagine today, what do we have? 5.2 billion or maybe even nearly 6 billion people on the earth, all of whom have sin natures, all of whom sin every day, and most of them are unbelievers, constantly sinning, yet our Lord Jesus Christ bore the sins of all the world, not only all the 6 billion who are here today, but the billions who were here before today. Starting with Adam and Eve all the way till the end of time, he bore the sins of all the world. And uh, he started to contemplate this. And he started to contemplate the pain of it. He, You see, Jesus Christ was perfect. He had nothing to do with sin. He had never sinned. He looked at sin as gross and awful. And yet he was going to take the responsibility for the sins of the entire human race. So guess what? He became depressed. It's not a sin. And uh, you may become depressed sometimes. We all do. I do. You have, I'm sure. And when we get depressed, we might not feel good, but it doesn't mean we're sinning. You can be filled with God, the Holy Spirit, and have uh, some depression. Now, if you let it overtake your life, uh, then, of course, it might lead to some type of sin. But depression in itself is not sin, sometimes physiological. The Apostle Paul describes himself as being depressed, and yet he was not sinning. And then many people in the Bible became depressed. But poor old Timothy became depressed, and uh, the Apostle Paul told him to drink some wine for his stomach's sake. Yet if he were to overindulge that uh, alcohol in itself is a depressant, then if he overindulged over a long period of time, he too would become depressed. Uh, but uh, a depression could be physiological, but in this case it might be both for our Lord Jesus Christ. And depression is not a sin, because if our Lord became anguished and depressed, then of course... It is not sin because he is not a sinner, never has been. And there are certain physiological reasons for depression. And this coupled with the idea of going to the cross naturally created depression for our Lord Jesus Christ. He knew what was going to happen uh, very soon. He knew he was going to be judged for all the sins of the world. And that was what he was thinking about. He was thinking specifically about that. Now, he wasn't thinking about the fact that he would be beaten and skinned alive with a whip, cat of nine tails. You've seen probably uh, the Passion of the Christ where they... Uh, where all the physical things, they showed all the physical things that are just terrible, and they showed him scream, but he was like a lamb uh, before the shears and said not a word. He never did scream while they beat him. And with the cat of nine tails, and they ripped his whole flesh apart, nobody could even recognize him. He was nothing but goo, and he never even screamed. But he didn't even, he wasn't even thinking about that. He knew that was going to happen, but he wasn't thinking about it. And he wasn't thinking about the nails being shoved through his hands and feet and the fact that his bones would be pulled apart while he hung there, which is very painful. He didn't even think about the physical pain. He started to think about receiving the sins of all the world, receiving the cup, re receiving the sins and being judged for the sins of all the world. He started thinking about being, being forsaken by God the Father, and he got depressed. And that's it. So, so what? Now, who wouldn't? And this is in his humanity, by the way. Deity cannot get depressed. But his humanity became depressed. And depression is not sin. But, of course, uh, uh, complaining, and he never complains, complaining uh, could lead to sin as part of that. And also, worry is a sin. And worry can bring on depression. Uh, but uh, sometimes you can be depressed and uh, 
for no other reason than physiological, but he definitely has a reason because the cross is so ghastly. The 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 bearing the sins of the world it's undescribable. I can't describe it for you up here. The extraordinary pain of bearing the billions upon billions upon billions of sins of all the world. It's impossible to describe. It is uh, beyond me to describe, and uh, we will never know on this earth uh, just how much pain our Lord went through and dealt with it all alone. And He did this alone, by the way. And so Jesus Christ faced the greatest pressure, and He faced the issue right here, and He did this using His unique spiritual life. And he did it alone. He did, he did it apart from God the Father when he was on the cross and when God the Father turned his back on him. He did it with the unique spiritual life. He didn't run around to everybody like they do today when somebody has a trivial problem. Pray for me, pray for me, etc., etc., etc. Well, of course, we are commanded to have intercessory prayer for others. But I'm, I'm not talking about that, and I'm not talking about anyone here in particular. I'm talking about uh, most of Christianity in the outside world. They're so weak because they have no doctrine, and they, don't, uh, they can't live their spiritual life on their own. They need to lean on somebody who's an idiot. And they can't even, uh, and they're just leaning on each other, a bunch of crutches. You, you could, uh, I could draw a picture of a church and then uh, show the pew, and then and in all the pews is a bunch of crutches, and then there's a, the big crutch, the pastor standing up there, and that's all a bunch of crutches uh, leaning on each other, lean on me because you're not strong, etc. There's a song about that, but with Bible doctrine you can be strong, and Jesus Christ did it all alone, and He passed down the very same unique spiritual life that He lived. He's passed it down to us. So the key to going to the cross was his volition. He became depressed. And you know what? Christ could have said no way. In his depression, he could have went on negative signals and he could have said, I'm not doing this for these billions of idiots. And these people have always uh, neglected me. He could have took it and he could have took it personal. These people have always neglected me and rejected me and talked about me. Even one of my own, who, who wasn't his own, we'll see that because he calls him associate, but even one of my associates is betraying me. Forget all of you. All of you go to hell. I got angels that will save me. Bye-bye. He didn't do that. And this shows, well, it all depends on the volition, the free will of Christ. Our salvation depended on the, hum the volition of the humanity of Christ. And the key for you is your volition. The key for our salvation was Christ's volition. The key for you in growing up in your spiritual life is your volition. The key for you is to make Bible doctrine number one day in and day out. And then you can handle all your problems on your own. You don't need to lean on anybody. You lean on the Word of God. And if you lean on anybody, you lean on Christ, who paved the way, paved the way. So what we see here is the fact that uh, Jesus Christ has volition. And we'll see this in the prayer that he makes very shortly. Then he said in 2638, Then he said to them, My soul is deeply sorrowful. Still talking about being depressed. Unto physical death. Noting the fact that he is going to suffer a death on the cross. So he tells them, Stay here and be vigilant. Now, he's not begging them to pray for him, and we'll see this in a minute. He's just telling them, stay here and be vigilant. In other words, uh, stay here, use doctrine, and, and maybe even pray for yourselves, uh, but I am going away, so stay here. 
So basically what he's telling the disciples, or the, uh, the sons of Zebedee, Matthew's not here, by the way, but he got it because of the inspiration of uh, the doctrine of inspiration and uh, all of that related to Scripture. And so he said, uh, uh, stay here, and I'll go away and uh, pray because I'm deeply sorrowful. I'm depressed. And I'm going to pray. Going a little farther, or further, as we would say, he threw himself down with his face to the ground and kept on praying. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. What is the cup? The cup is the sins of the entire world. And that's what we do on communion is uh, recognize the cup as the uh, being the sins of the entire world being poured out and judged on Jesus Christ. And that's what the cup represents. And that's what he says right here. If it is possible, let this cup with the sins of the world pass from me. He didn't want to go to the cross. And he got depressed. He didn't want to go and he got depressed. A natural reaction. And what he says is, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Now from his volition it would be possible. And there would be no eternal salvation for us. But then Satan would be the victor. Uh, but what this really means is, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What it really means is this. If there's a, another way, Father, for there to be salvation for the people, don't let the cup come on me if there's another way. That's what it really means. And... Uh, but there was no other way because Scripture makes it clear. There's no name under heaven by which man can be saved except Jesus Christ. There's only one way of salvation. And our Lord didn't want to go, and so He goes to God the Father and says, If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Then He says, Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So even though he didn't want to go, he's still being submissive. He's not sinning, and he's still going to go through with the plan of God the Father. And this has principle for when we pray. When we pray, we should always pray in God's will. And when we ask for something, uh, sometimes we might be in a jam and we might ask for something stupid that we don't even know is stupid. God knows it's stupid. We don't. And so we just ask for the craziest of things. And so uh, so what you do after your prayer and your personal petition, you say, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And that's the correct way to pray. And, uh, if, for example, uh, somebody, some young man might be... Uh, uh, love struck with some young girl and he'll go into prayer and it'll be a stupid prayer and say uh, this woman's my right woman I want to marry her and uh, God let this all work out and I'm going to marry her etc and it might be the stupidest prayer ever because she might not be his right woman and he might not know enough doctrine to know any better and so uh, if anyone were to make such a stupid prayer, then at the end of it, they would just simply say, Nevertheless, let your will be done. And uh, then uh, move on. In other words, that shows your obedience to the plan of God and the fact that uh, you're not going to take things out of His hands. And just as 1 Peter 5, 7 says, you've just ca you just cast everything in the hands of the Lord. And that is, uh, actually, that's part of prayer. And when we pray, we are literally uh, acknowledging to ourselves and to God that we're casting everything in His hands. Then in 2640, Then He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Now He's bringing up Peter again, and it's obvious that Peter either wants to be leader of the group or Jesus Christ has appointed him leader of the group. Either way, uh, Peter is the one our Lord is always uh, conversing with. And so he says this. He said to Peter, 
And actually he kept on saying from the Greek, meaning he had a hard time waking up. Peter did. And he said, what? You know, he had to say it pretty loud. Peter's asleep, probably even snoring. I can picture uh, Peter as a bearded large man who's just laying there snoring. And then Jesus Christ walks up and says, What? And so, then he says, You couldn't stay alert with me for one hour. So what do we note from this? Well, we note obviously that the whole prayer is not given to us. We got part of the prayer that uh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. That takes about 15 seconds to say. (laughs) So we're missing about uh, uh, a whole hour of prayer, but it's not for us to know what he prayed. And it was probably so deep we wouldn't understand it, what our Lord prayed with all the doctrine he knew. And so he said, what, you couldn't stay alert with me for an hour? Then in 2641, he gives them instructions. Keep on being vigilant. To be vigilant means to uh, keep on utilizing doctrine and pray. Now is he saying, and pray for me? No. (laughs) And he's about to go to the cross. And he's not even requesting prayer from his own disciples. But what he tells them to do is to pray for themselves and pray so that you will not enter into temptation. Now most of us, if we were going through a hard situation, especially anything close to this, although the thought would be blasphemous, but we would be trying to solicit the whole world to pray for us. <laughs> and uh, it's almost a natural reaction because prayer is powerful. And uh, there are uh, instances where you put people on the uh, sick list if they're sick and you pray for them. And prayer is a powerful weapon. But what I want you to notice is that Jesus Christ doesn't even request prayer for himself. But he requests that the disciples pray for themselves. And he does this because he knows they're going to fall flat on their face. They're sitting there falling asleep and our Lord knows what's about to come down the pike. And so he just says, you couldn't be alert with me for an hour. Well now, you be vigilant and pray so that you will not enter into the into temptation. Then he says, the Spirit is willing... And that is to do the will of God, but the flesh is weak. They were tired. And I can imagine they would be tired following Jesus Christ around. Uh, Jesus Christ, I could imagine, didn't, especially during this time of his life, wasn't getting much sleep at all, which in his humanity would uh, also uh, cause depression. If you don't get enough sleep, you're going to get depressed. And our Lord had been teaching. He'd been ripping people apart. He'd been throwing out money changers. He'd been doing all sorts of things. And uh, apparently he hadn't had much sleep. And apparently the disciples hadn't had much sleep because every time Jesus went away, they just poof, passed out. Uh, they, they were tired. And we can imagine why, and we'd probably be the same way. And this is really not an indication against them in any way. It's just that uh, they were tired. Our Lord knew what was about to happen to them. And in his humanity, he was getting depressed. And part of that, obviously, had to do with lack of sleep and other things. But uh, he never sinned, of course. 2641, keep on being vigilant and pray so that you will not enter into temptation. The Spirit is willing. He knew that they were willing to do the will of God, but the flesh is weak. And we all know about the weakness of the flesh, not in terms of sexuality, but the weakness of the flesh in terms of uh, we get sleepy and tired, and uh, like now, and some of us want to do like that, but that's just natural. It's just part of life. We all get tired after a hard day's work. Then 2642. He went away a second time and kept on saying, My Father, 
since it is not possible. Now he, he knows that there is no other way that the, uh, he knows this, he knew this to start with, that there's no other way that the world is going to, going to have salvation except if he uh, provides the way. So he says, My Father, since it is not possible for this cup to pass away unless I drink it, unless I die as a substitute for all the world, your will must be completed. So he's been struggling with it, with it. And then finally he went down on positive signals and said, I'm going to do it. And this has to do with the fact that there is no name under heaven by which man can be saved except our Lord Jesus Christ. And he realized that and said, all right, I'm the only man here for the job. I'm going to do it. And he did it. 2643. He came, and then, and then he comes after he prays again, and, uh, uh, maybe for another hour, it doesn't say, but he came back. He came and found them sleeping again because they could not keep their eyes open. So he left them again and went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same thing once more. He didn't even bother with them that time. And maybe he thought, well, he had just resolved something in his mind. He said, I'm going to the cross. Then he came back to check on the, the disciples and to keep vigilant and to keep watch. He saw them all there sleeping there and he said, I'm going to the cross anyway. And walked back out and just walked right back around and prayed the same thing. Now, why is he praying the same thing? And we've all read the passage where we're not supposed to repeat prayers like the uh, unbelievers do in order that they may be heard. But uh, he's going back and praying the same thing. Now what the unbeliever does is praise the same thing over and over again in succession right then. Uh, for example, the unbeliever, I don't know, maybe he's hungry and wants some uh, bacon. And he'll say, I want bacon, I want bacon, I want bacon. And pray to God for it like that. And however many times he prays for it, he thinks that uh, God will grant it. But this isn't what Jesus did. Jesus had a long, prolonged prayer for about an hour. Then he went and checked on the disciples. Then he turned around, walked back, and he prayed the same prayer for another hour. Now the reason why he did that, did this is because that... Uh, uh, prayer was prayer is, and it is part of our utilization of the faith rest drill and self assurance. And you say, why pray? A lot of people have asked this. Uh, since God knows everything, and since God knows what's going to happen in my life, and since God knows what's going to happen to me tomorrow and the next day and twenty years from now, why even bother to pray? Well, it is uh, what Jesus Christ prayed, and it's utilization of the faith rest drill, and it brings self-assurance to you. And he had made his decision. So he went back to God the Father, and he prayed to him uh, with self-assurance, saying, Yes, Father, I'm going to the cross, since this is the only way. And he went back and repeated it. So there's nothing wrong with what he did. It just means he was doctrinally oriented and he was depressed and he this was the only way that he could soothe himself was through prayer and through utilization of the faith rest drill. In other words, he soothed himself through doctrine rather than using a substitute, which would be sin. And a lot of people use substitutes, soothe themselves through drugs, soothe themselves through overindulgence in alcohol, or soothe themselves through uh, some, some other system, the marijuana, or however they want to soothe themselves. And this isn't what our Lord did. He, he didn't turn to those things. He simply used the faith rest drill and prayer. And in his prayer, it was self, self-soothing. And it showed his doctrinal orientation. And then in 20, we'll get to finished up here pretty quick. Then in 2645, then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping? Look, the hour is approaching, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. 
You see, the second time he didn't bother him because uh, he had already come. He had already settled the issue in his mind. He's going to the cross. He's going to do the, the the will of the Father. Now he's waking him up now, waking up the disciples now because uh, there's about to be a whole gang of people with clubs and swords coming up. And he's waking him up, saying, "Get up! They're here now. They're, they've come to get me. It's time to get up." So this is what he says in twenty four. Uh, twenty six or twenty four twenty six forty six twenty six forty six and actually in the Greek what it says is get up and get going get up and get going and he says this because in the Greek it already indicates he knows they're going to fail he knows they're all going to scatter they're all going to be scared and they're all going to run in all different directions get up and get going Let us go. Look, my betrayer is here. And tomorrow night we will see who the betrayer is and what happens. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things. And may we come to understand the importance of the word of God. And may we come to understand that we must live our protocol spiritual life just as our Lord lived his prototype spiritual life and took that spiritual life all the way to the cross. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.